And so with that said, we're going to be looking today at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 15 through 18 as uh, Paul is about to conclude his, his letter to the Thessalonians. And as is my normal way of teaching, I'm going to get those of you who perhaps weren't with us last time, I'll get you up to speed in the particular portion of Scripture by reviewing some things, give you a little insights or some other things I didn't teach uh, you in the past. And then what we'll do is we'll uh, eventually arrive at verse 15. I'll take you from verses 15 through 18 as we continue our uh, study through and series through the book of First, the First Thessalonians. So beginning at verse 15, reading to verse 18, First Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul writes, See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So Paul has been giving commands. Again, here's your review. Paul has been, been giving commands related to the church and in the recent study related to peace in the body of Christ or peace in the church. And, and he had given a command. That command is found in verse 13 here in chapter uh, 5 when he concluded that verse by simply saying, Be at peace among yourselves. So up until this chapter, Paul had been commending the church. Paul has been commending the health of the body of Christ. And as we've gone through 1 Thessalonians, you'll remember that he spoke of their faith, of their love, of their patience, of hope. He spoke of their spirit-filled power, their faithfulness. He commended them uh, for their steadfastness under affliction and persecution, for the evangelistic efforts, their rejection of idolatry, their patient awaiting of the Lord Jesus Christ. Through this epistle, he spoke of his concern for them. He spoke of his deep love for them. And he spoke of their deep love in return for him. He exhorted them to live in a way that pleases God, to live sexually pure lives, to lead quiet and productive lives, to encourage one another to live for Christ. And as he was about to conclude he began to say in verse 12, he began to say that they were to recognize, in chapter 5 here, to recognize their hardworking leaders. They were to appreciate, in other words, to value them, to hold them in high esteem because these leaders, and he was commending to them and encouraging them or commanding them to, to uh, appreciate. He was saying that the church leaders had taught them, had cared for them, visited them, had protected them. They'd been faithful and therefore, they should be honored for their labor as well as their love. Now, because they are going to be involved in these, uh, the sheep in the body of Christ in their lives, he said, instead of resenting them because you consider them intrusive, they should be valued for their work's sake. They love you. And because they do, they should be loved in return. He reminded them that these leaders who are to be appreciated are actually gifts. They're gifts given to the people of the body of Christ for the good of the body. I had mentioned to you in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 that uh, he appointed some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the, for the work of ministry. They were to edify the body of Christ. So they should recognize these people who are, who are shepherding, who are ministering to them, who rule in the sense of having a, a position of authority and leadership. You should be, he's saying, you should be appreciative of them for the work that they're doing, their gifts from God. And it, it reminded us, as we looked at this last time of Jeremiah 3.15, where God has said, I'll give you shepherds according to my own heart, and they, they will feed you uh, with knowledge and understanding. And so he was speaking to them concerning the life of the church, the leadership of the church, and therefore, as he was speaking to them concerning their leaders, he said they should be esteemed highly for their work's sake. Now, what was that work? Again, I'll mention this to you and then uh, continue on. Uh, what was their work? What was the thing that these leaders were doing? Why should they be appreciated? Well, they were teaching. They were teaching them the Word of God. They were living out the Word of God. And this was helping them to see how Jesus works in somebody's life more clearly. He said, these, these men, these leaders that he's referring to are, are caring for you, and they're great examples of what it means to be a believer. You know, today we, we, we speak concerning, um, you know, somebody say, says to you, what are you? And if, 
you, you, you may not be a church-going person, but m- many times in early days, much more than now, but people would say, well, you know, I'm a Christian. But they didn't even know what a Christian was, and therefore they, they, they just use that because they're not something else. And so Paul is speaking concerning what it means to be a believer and how you act in the body of Christ, how you, how you live in the church. And, and, and he says, this is why you appreciate these people, because they're teaching you how to live for Jesus Christ. That exhortation reminds me of something that the uh, writer of Hebrews had, had uh, written to the church in Hebrews 13, verse 7. In Hebrews 13, verse 7, it says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Now, when he says remember, you need to uh, call to mind the fact that that when he says remember, it, it means that many of those who were leaders of that church had already died. Remember them is what he's saying because they've already passed on. So he says remember them. Don't forget. Don't forget those who gave spiritual guidance to you by teaching you the word of God. Don't forget their faith. And don't forget how they closed out their lives. Remember that these leaders that he's saying in Hebrews 13, 7, remember that these leaders were faithful unto death, and remember that they died with the peace of Christ. They too had endured afflictions. They too had been persecuted, yet they remained faithful through it all. So their faith and their life is worthy of imitation. And if you do imitate their way of life, you too will be blessed, even as they were These are the kinds, uh, the writer was saying, of believers who are worthy of modeling your life after. So he's saying to them, appreciate your leaders. Appreciate your spiritual leaders. Why? Because what they're doing for you is out of godly love and concern. I mentioned to you that the heart of a true and mature shepherd is centered on one basic desire. And that would be that the people that they're caring for will mature in their faith in the way that they live. So by submitting to the Lord and biblical leadership, peace should be the result. And so he's going on as he's sharing concerning life in the church, and he exhorts the leaders to labor on what produces unity in the church. He had already mentioned those who were unruly or faint-hearted, those who are weak. He said, encourage them, exhort them, because it makes it possible for peace to exist in the church in the midst of the pressures. So the following instructions continue to direct the elders to preserve unity. And they follow logically after the command to be at peace amongst yourself. You see, again, in the face of affliction and persecution, pressure can cause tension. And tension, if left untreated, can lead to problems in the church. And tensions in the church can cause discord and produce division. Remember, under stress, believers can turn on one another because they're frustrated. Now, this is one reason to command Christians to pursue peace with one another. Like it says in Psalm 34, verse 14, turn away from evil, do good, seek peace and pursue it. Or Romans 14, verse 19, let us pursue what leads to peace and to mutual edification. One of the most effective devices of the devil is sowing seeds of discord. Discord, according to Proverbs chapter 6, is one of the seven things God hates, the one who sows discord amongst the brethren. Now, as human beings, we're already prone to care primarily about ourselves, and I know that people would argue and say, no, that's not true, I'm very giving, I don't care about myself that much. And maybe that's true in their mind. But if I take a picture of them in a group, who's the first person they're going to look for? It isn't going to be somebody else. They're going to say, oh, look at my hair, or look at my smile that's crooked, or my glasses. You know, they're going to look for themselves. Why is that? Because it's our natural propensity to look to ourselves first. That's why we have to die to ourselves. That's where we're commanded. We have to be commanded to care about somebody else. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, Paul said it like this. He said, If there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. 
Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Put the concerns of others before your own. Learn to do that. Love is actually the willingness to lay down your life for somebody else. So put your concern for yourself aside as you pursue concern for others. Again, it has to be taught. We learn it not only verbally, but we're taught by example. And that's something that we need to learn to do. In churches, putting yourself before others actually will cause strife and division. When you're selfish, it, it, it creates an angry atmosphere. It undermines the peace and harmony of the church. When you read your Bible, you're going to see something, and I wanted to develop this for just a moment. Again, I'm laying a foundation for us here, but when you read your Bible, you'll notice that Paul, as he wrote in his letters, very often uh, encouraged believers to unity. I'll give you a couple of examples. For example, when he wrote to the Corinthians in uh, 1 Corinthians, in chapter 1, verse 10, this is what he said to them in his letter. He said, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. When he wrote to the Roman church in chapter 12, verse 16, he said, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but enjoy the company of the lowly. Do not be conceited. In Ephesians 4, verse 3, to the churches in Ephesus, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. You see, disunity undermines effectiveness. So unity is to be pursued. It's to be worked for. And unity, when the body of Christ is united, is one of the ways that the world that doesn't believe in Christ can have opportunity to hear the gospel and even receive him. Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 21, and this is what he prayed. Jesus prayed believers would be one, even as he said, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. May they be one. You see, few things undermine the gospel of peace more than warring church members. They call them church wars. And church wars are carnal and they're worldly and they're destructive to the mission of the body of Christ. Now, one interesting occurrence is noted in Paul's letter to the church of Philippi. Remember that Paul, the apostle, was a missionary church planter, and when he would plant a church, he would remain long enough to disciple leadership. He would then leave these elders, and he would go to plant other churches. Because he was no longer physically able to be there, on occasion, he would write them letters. When you read your New Testament, Paul wrote something like 13 letters. And these letters contain instruction and encouragement to the churches. So what would happen is Paul would write a letter and send it to the church. It would be delivered to the church. And then that pastor would read the letter to the congregation. Now, the people would be told a letter has arrived and pastor is going to read it and so they would gather and they would gather to hear the letter as it was read by the apostle Paul and so as they sat there listening they would want to hear what he was writing so you can imagine how they felt when they heard some of the things that Paul wrote so imagine for a moment that we're the church in Corinth the church has been called together we have a letter from Paul. Come and listen to what he has to say to us. The church shows up in droves. They're seated there quietly listening as the pastor begins to read. And he gets to what we call 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. And as he's reading, he reads these words. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me there are quarrels among you. Imagine how Chloe must have felt at that moment. Her name was mentioned. Ratted me out. But fact is, she's informed me that there are quarrels. You guys are not united. How did they react when Timothy read a letter that he got, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 19 and 20? When Timothy's doing that, he's reading, 
I have delivered Hymenaeus and Alexander to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Hymenaeus and, and, and uh, Alexander were leaders well known, and yet Paul the Apostle is, is, is calling them out in church as the letter's being, being written. They, they need to, uh, read. They, they, they may learn not to blaspheme. They have veered off the course of good teaching. They've accepted false teaching. One of the more personal things Paul wrote was found in the book of Philippians as the people were listening once again to what uh, the pastor was reading. He came to this part of the letter. Now again, the people are seated quietly. They're listening to the reading of Paul's letter. Everybody's seated listening. And he comes to what we call chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And as he's reading, he reads, Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. And now I'd say, yeah, I will. I'm going to stand fast. Okay. But he continues, I implore you, Odia, and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. He called them out. Yodia and Syntyche. In modern translation, he says, tell those broads to get it together. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> But how would you feel? Your name. You know, you can be until your name is mentioned. You can be bored. You hear your name. Your ears perk up. But he's saying, you know what? Lighten it up. You guys are a bad example. Get it together. Be united. Now, how do you think they felt when they heard that? They were corrected in a very public way. at me. No. John, you're fired. <laughs> Should I keep trying? Okay. Okay. I wonder how they felt. Let's put ourselves in their place for just a moment. How, <laughs> how would you feel if you were called out in church, how would you feel today if you were called out in church? I want you to think about that. Of course, that's not going to happen. But what would happen? How would I feel if my pastor was reading and said, David, you got to get it together? How would I feel? How do you feel Yodi and Sintiki felt? They were, they were corrected in a very public way. I wonder, I wonder if they left the church. Now, these were leaders. I wonder if they left and they said, Paul, Paul judged me and Paul embarrassed me and so I'm going to go to another church. That is the more common thing that would happen. If somebody is convicted for something that everybody knows is going on and it's simply brought to light, very often what happens is that person who is convicted just gets up and leaves and take their sin and their sinful attitude with them and then like leaven, they pollute another lump. They just go somewhere else. They complain. They draw their friends with them. Do you think Euodia and Syntyche did that? No, of course they didn't. They heard what was being said. They repented. They continued on. They humbled themselves. And so unity is extremely important in a church. And Paul is instructing the leaders to encourage it. And that's why in verse 15... He says, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. So what he's speaking about is continuing a thought of keeping unity and peace in the body of Christ. Now, he's been addressing at this point the leadership in the church, and he's telling the, the leaders to, to minister with authority over the body of Christ. He has told them to set an example, and he's told them you have responsibilities you need to, to warn the unruly. You need to comfort the faint-hearted. You are to uphold the, the weak. You're to be patient with all. And so this is simply a continuation of his instruction. And that's why he moves on and says in verse 15, see that no one renders evil to anyone. Now with such intense persecution, that, that he's saying teach the church to avoid the response of retaliation. In the face of this, believers are to eliminate the natural desire to retaliate when someone has hurt them. Now, when he says to them that they are not to render evil for evil, 
their response is not to be one out of weakness, but it's to be a response out of uh, a desire to maintain peace. See, if, if somebody gets in your face, even in our day, especially we'll say in our day as an example, somebody gets in your face, and this is a big, rough person, it, it doesn't take a lot of courage to back down. It doesn't take a lot of courage to just say, my bad, I'm sorry. It doesn't take courage at all to do that. You know, if this person, i uh, use a male as an example, me and some big old dude comes and towers over me and says, I'm going to tear your head off. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of courage for me to look at this guy and say, please don't. Please don't. I like my head. I kind of like it. It's been there for a while. It didn't take courage for me to, to back down, to put my hands up and say, you know, whatever, my bad. It, that, that's not courageous. That's actually wise. It, it keeps my teeth in my mouth, and I appreciate them. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, it doesn't take courage to do that. So you can. You can back down, not out of a position of strength so much, but simply because you're weaker. When you're younger, though, and somebody comes up and gets in your face like that, and you, you're weighing it, and you're looking, and you're saying, I, 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 don't, I can take you out. When you have that attitude, and you humble yourself, that's different. Because it's simply common sense to back down when somebody has greater power than you. It just makes sense. But when you have greater power than them, and you don't render evil for evil, it requires something deeper than that. It requires humility. When you look at Jesus Christ, and he's in, and he's in the garden, and he's being taken by these officers, and, and the apostle Peter pulls out a sword so that he might defend him, he says, put your sword away. You know, his father could have sent a legion of angels and destroyed everybody. Jesus humbly allowed himself to be taken. So humility is actually a virtue. Being afraid or stepping out because it's wisdom is not, is not necessarily an act of, of, of humility and virtue at all. It's simply wise to do that. But what happens when you have the power in your hand to be able to take care of business in a physical way and yet you humble yourself? That's the best thing to do. That's why it's a strong person. It takes the strength. Jesus was meek above all men. He didn't need a legion of angels. With a word, he could have taken care of it himself. When they came and he said, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Remember how Jesus says, I am he? And what happened? They all fell to their faces. And that was just disclosing, this is who I am, let alone what he could have done in an instant. But he didn't do anything like that. He allowed himself to be taken and killed demonstrating to us the power of humility and an awareness of the plan of God. And so when somebody is saying things about you and can hurt you in a church, instead of retaliating and trying to take revenge, you actually learn to live at peace. You actually do so because it's not an act of weakness. It's actually an act of moral courage. It's humility. It's a real strength. In Romans 12, 17, Paul said, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the sight of everyone. Or Romans 12, 19, Do not take revenge, my dear friends. Leave room for God's wrath. It's written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. When Peter was writing in 1 Peter 3, verse 9, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with evil insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. Do not render evil for evil. You know, I have on my, on my desk in my office a letter that somebody wrote me. I've known this person a long time. Haven't seen him for a long time. And a while back, I had written to them, and I, I had said, you know, uh, I love you. I haven't seen you. And just want you to know I love you. 
It's been a long time, years. It's been years. I won't give you a lot of details you're not interested in. But I had written, and that, that letter I wrote was years ago. And I left it alone. I thought perhaps there's something that I need to hear or something, whatever. So I got a letter, just it's on my desk. Got it last week where they they went through a litany of things that that I fail in and what I'm not. And at first I'm reading it saying, This isn't true. I didn't do these things. And it hurt. It hurt my heart. I thought, my goodness. That that's that's not right. Why'd you say that? I'm gonna kill you. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I just felt it. No, I, I thought, this is not right. So I've had it on my desk, and I've been praying every day. Father, how do, how do I respond with kindness and love, honesty, but humility? How do we do that? Because I want to live at peace with everyone. And I don't want people to, to think that I don't love them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do you do that? And it just so happens I was preparing this study and the Lord was saying, don't render evil for evil. Don't retaliate. There are so many things that I could say. We all know that. If a husband and a wife are together, they're having a difference. And the husband says something to the wife. She's got a list of things that she knows he hasn't been doing. That you can go bang, 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 bang. And then you wound rather than heal, right? That's just life. We do that. We retaliate. We have a tendency of wanting no, you can't say that about me. I didn't do that. I'm innocent. How could you say that about me? How could you? So my natural tendency is to defend myself. Wait a minute. How can you say that about me? I never did that. How? So I've sat it on the desk, and I've been praying for a week. Father, may I have words that are kind and healing, not piercing, not mean, but honest. Can't we work this through? I've known this person for years, years. And I don't want to lose him as a friend. So you humble yourself and you seek the Lord. Because God says, seek peace with all men. And that's my desire. Is that from weakness? I'm right. No, I'm in the right. I'm in the right. But how can I help this person to see? I hear their heart. But maybe you need to see this part. How can we do that? See, so being a Christian and being a pastor doesn't eliminate people like me from having the tendency of wanting to stand up for yourself for an unjust accusation. At the same time, being a Christian means I want to seek peace and unity so that we can love one another and love Jesus the way we're supposed to. So Paul is giving good advice and direction to us in this, and he's letting us know that this is how you do it. You love them. Now, getting back to the study here, we need to know that Paul isn't addressing um, the times that you uh, need to use what has been called necessary or reasonable force in protecting yourself or somebody else. He's not saying that because we know that, that there are times when self-defense or the defense of others is actually a virtue and is, the, is needed. It's proper. There are such things as justifiable wars. There are times when police intervention is a good thing. Protecting someone else who is in need is a good thing. It's actually a moral thing. But in the church, peace is to be sought for and worked for. It's something to be desired and something to be protected. In 2 Corinthians 13, 11, uh, Paul said it like this. He said, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of con good comfort. Be of one mind. And he goes on to say, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. So it's obvious that pursuing peace in the church needs to be done. But pursuing peace is not something that's restricted to just church life because notice in verse 15, he said, pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Pursue peace with people in general should be the rule of your life. Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So refusing to seek vengeance isn't something that comes naturally. It, it is something 
that is accomplished by valuing how much God has forgiven us of our sins. In Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. If God forgave you, if God forgave me, I should be ready and willing and even quick to forgive those who have hurt me. You see, failing to forgive hardens your heart. And in marriage, it can be especially, especially difficult if you want to render evil for evil, if you don't have a willingness or a heart to, to forgive. Jesus said failure to forgive results in the hardness of a heart that precedes divorce. In Matthew 19, 8, Jesus said, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it wasn't so. So what is it that I should do? What is my attitude towards a believer who has hurt me? Let it go. Apply grace. Respond with love and understanding. Colossians 3, 13 and 14 says it like this. Bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Why would I do that? Well, that's how Jesus responded. In 1 Peter 2, 23, it says, When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. So we pursue, we strive for, we reach out for what is both good for us and, and for others. We pursue what is kind, what is beneficial, what is generous, not only for ourselves, but for others. Our way of life is kind. It's the kind of life that blesses all people, including non-believers. Christians volunteer, not just for other Christians, but when things happen, we, we volunteer to be of help in disaster or we contribute our funds to help those in need. Galatians 6 verse 10 says, whenever we have opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those who are in the family of faith. And so he's saying this is what we're to do. He says, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. Always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Then he goes on in verse 16, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks. These are three basic commands. Rejoice, pray, and be thankful. Instead of living in anger, we rejoice because we know that things will work out. I've been asked in the past, what is the one thing that you would say would sum up the lessons God has taught you throughout your walk with the Lord? And it's very simple. It all works out in the end. It all works out in the end. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. It all works together. And so with this knowledge that God is in control, I can have an attitude of rejoicing. And it's the attitude of rejoicing, to rejoice always, that motivates us. In Psalm 13, verse 5, I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Psalm 40, verse 16, let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. Rejoice. Now, the unique quality of Christian joy is that it doesn't depend on our circumstances. The word happiness is sometimes used for the word joy, and those aren't the same words. The word happiness is a derivative of the word happenings. The word happenings talks about our circumstances. I can be happy if I get a raise. I can be happy if I get a new car or if I some benefit, I'm happy that I got those things because those circumstances have motivated my response. Joy is different. Joy is the, is the fruit of the Spirit of God. We can rejoice always even if we're in hard circumstances because our God is in control. Our God is taking care of us. And, and joy is not something that is necessarily revealed by us laughing and, and smiling it, it, re, it results from knowing that the Lord's in control and trusting him. In Hebrews 12, verses 2 and 3, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, 
scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It was for the joy that was set before him. He accomplished his purpose. He was crowned with glory. He was faithful to death. He provided salvation for us, and that brought joy. So joy is not my circumstances. Secondly, pray without ceasing. Prayer is the evidence of consistent fellowship with God. It reveals dependence on him and intimacy with him. Knowing that God hears us brings us comfort and joy as we cry out, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Call unto me, I'll answer thee, I'll show you how faithful I am. Pray without ceasing. The Lord began teaching me about prayer when I first got saved. I got saved in 1970. I went into the military in March of 1971. We were in basic training. We were in Fort Ord. We got a weekend pass and... So we were on our way home. We had a friend who had a car large enough to hold us, my friend Bill and me, as well as uh, I, I think there were six or seven of us in this car. So we're all piled into this old car, driving from Fort Ord, going south, going to, uh, to where I lived. Bill and I lived in, in, uh, in Norwalk. We had a friend who lived in, in Huntington Beach. And so we're in this old car driving, and we were 10 miles to the north of Santa Maria when the car broke down. Some of you are familiar with the road that goes up and through Santa Maria, goes up north towards San Luis Obispo and going up in that direction. And it was a two-lane at that time. It wasn't, it's not as large. They, they broadened, they widened it a long time ago. But then it was simply a two-laner. And there we are pulled over on the side of the road in the dirt, and there's no traffic going by in that area. And we're thinking, how are we going to get home for a weekend? And so I did the natural thing. I walked to the side of the road, and I was going to wait for a car to pass by, and I was going to try and thumb a ride, see how far I could get. My friend Bill is the one who introduced me to Calvary Chapel. He's the one that uh, we went in the military together. And so he said, you know what? Let's pray and ask God. God could give us a ride now, I'm a brand-new Christian. Why couldn't I? I mean, it's just a ride. It's no big deal. I'm not asking him to raise the dead. I'm asking him for a ride home. It makes sense to me. So I said, okay, let's ask him. I still remember standing with Bill. We were the only two Christians out of a carload of guys, and, and we prayed, Jesus, we want to go home. Would you help us, please? Thank you. That's, you know, really deep prayer. And so as we're there, we just kind of stood, and here comes a Volkswagen. And it's coming from the north, coming south towards Santa Maria. Again, Santa Maria is 10 miles to our south. To our south. And so it's a, it, it pulls over, this, this Volkswagen, the driver pulls over, and we're standing, and it's a young girl. She couldn't have been 18, 17, 18 years old. And she's got a brother with her. Who is, he looked about 12 or 13. So they're two young people. And you've got about seven, maybe eight guys on the side of the road. And it's... It, 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 it's, it's what you would tell your daughter, never do. <laughs> and she pulls over, and the kid rolls the window down. It's a Volkswagen, and we stand in there. And she says, excuse me. She goes, I would never do this. She goes, but I'm a Christian, and the Spirit of God just told me to pull over to give you a ride. And I looked at her, and I said, get a better car. No, I, I looked at her. <laughs> and we, Bill and I just go, wow, wow, God answers prayer. And so we said, I still remember telling her, we're Christians too. We just prayed that God would give us a ride home. She says, well, here I am. She says, now, she goes, Those, there were several of us. She says, I can only take like two, two of you, three of you at the most in the back. I'll have to make a U-turn and come back. I'm going to go to the bus depot in Santa Maria. I'll drop them off, uh, drop you off, and come back and pick up the rest of you until all of you make it to the bus station. And so Bill and I said, well, take them first. So three guys hop into the back seat, off they go. We're just rejoicing like, Lord, you're too much. And so now what's God going to do? A Volkswagen van, Volkswagen was big during that day, a Volkswagen van pulls over, the hippie limousine. And as it pulls over, there's a single driver, but he says, where are you guys going? You know, you got to understand, we're GIs. And at that time, 
Hippies did not like military. You've got to understand that. Hippies did not like military. And we're there with these cuts. You know, we're obviously military, obviously. They pulled over anyway. And so we had a friend with us. His name was Mike. Mike climbs in the front, and Bill and I climb in the back because two of the other guys, we had already sent three. That's telling me how many we had. We sent three. Two of the guys were remaining behind, so Mike, Bill, and I climbed in the VW. In the back was some hippie guy just laying on a pillow, which was very common at that time. And, and so he says, what are you guys doing? And we said, peace. No, we said, <laughs> we're on our way home. He says, cool. And we begin talking to him. He's a Christian. So we talk about the Lord. We fall asleep. The, the guy driving the Volkswagen drives us to Norwalk, all the way to Norwalk, drops us off. He makes his way all the way to Huntington and drops my friend Mike off at his door. And I'm learning now that God answers prayer. And so I began to learn very early, ask me and I will show thee great and mighty things which you don't understand yet. Ask me. You have not because you ask not. Let me show you my goodness. And so very, very early at the beginning. And so now, years later, we, we begin uh, this ministry. And, and we were renting a, a building in, in Ontario. It, it was a Vine Street on Vine Street. It was called the Church of God, Seventh Day. We celebrated Christmas and so they said, these are pagans. We can't have pagans because you're celebrating a pagan holiday. And we go, wow, they kicked us out of the church. Turns out they were a cult. We didn't know it. We were just, oh. So they booted us out. We give you until the end of January. Every day, my friend Dan and my friend Randy, who Randy now pastors, Calvary Chapel in Upland, Dan pastors, Calvary Chapel, Clay Ellum in Washington. Every day we prayed and sought the Lord. We don't know what to do. We tried every place that we could find. We could not find a place. We only had 60 people in the church, and 60 people did not provide income. The average was around $300 a week. There was no way that we could afford any other place because we looked around. The only place that was open was Central School. They wanted $1,050 a month. We were spending $100 a, a month on a, a renting a, an office by Logan's Candy. It was only two doors uh, to the east of Logan's. A lot of you know Logan's Candy. They've been with us for, for forever. And so we didn't have a place. And now it's the middle of the month, and we only have a couple weeks to go, and we've looked everywhere. I still remember it was a Wednesday night going into my into my bedroom and falling literally on my face on the carpet, weeping before God. God, we don't have any place to go. We've tried every place. I don't know what to do. And so I got up. It was Wednesday night. Went and did a home Bible study. Came home and climbed into the bed. And as I climbed in bed, I heard the voice of the Lord in a still, small way say, you will need a place that seats 200 on Easter Sunday. I still remember hearing that. You, and, and then saying in response, it was such a comforting, natural thing. I still remember saying within myself, that's right. I went to sleep. The next day I was preparing the Sunday morning service, John 12, 24. Unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it'll produce much fruit. And so I remember closing my Bible and saying, Lord, I have died. Now, earlier in the week, I had written a letter to Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel. Prior to that, I had, when our church was fairly new, written and said, we'd like to be in association, in, in association with Calvary Chapel Ministries. I got a phone call from both Romaine as well as a, a guy, another guy, who said, um, sorry, you're too close to other Calvary Chapels. There's one in Claremont. There's one that was existing in Chino at that time, and we don't like churches planted on each other's doorsteps, and so no. You can't be one. So a couple, three weeks, a few weeks later, I wrote and said, you know, just letting you know, I'm still wanting to associate. I really feel that this is something the Lord would have for us and never got a response from that. And then finally, a few few uh, weeks later, a couple, three weeks later, I wrote a letter directly to Pastor Chuck. 
And I said, Chuck, this is who I am. This is what I've done. This is where I'm from. These are the things we're doing right now. Uh, I would love to be part of the Calvary Chapel ministry. And I had sent that out on a Monday. It's now Wednesday. And, I, and we're, we're being booted out. And the next day is a Thursday, and I'm preparing a Bible study. And, and the mailman comes up to, and drops off the mail. And I remember the voice of the Lord speaking, saying, your letter is here. And I got up and picked up this bundle of mail, and the very first letter I saw, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. I put it to the side. I went through the other, uh, other uh, letters that I received. I still remember putting the letter in front of me saying, Father, I, I desire to be a part of the Calvary ministry, but if you say no, I'll do whatever you say. I open it up, and it's a letter. We have that letter in the hallway where Pastor Chuck said, Welcome to the Association of Calvary Chapel Ministries. So... <laughs> He does abundantly above all you could ask or think. He does it all. God has that way. We're having that later on where we, we only had 60 people, but now it's Easter and, and it's pouring rain. Some of you who are from this area know that, uh, you know, sometimes it rains so hard that the water will go over the curbs. And in Ontario, the water runs on down and the curbs are actually higher on Sultana and, and Central. And uh, on, on uh, fourth, uh, Sixth Street in Central, um, or rather Sixth Street in Sultana, it'll it'll come over the curve. It was pouring rain, and now it's Easter, and I I remember going out uh, to the Easter Sunday service into the Central School because what had happened is we changed our, our names to Calvary Chapel. Our church doubled in size. The finances came in. We were able to rent and get out of the building that we were using. They gave us a two-month extension. And we were able to see the church grow to the point we could afford the $1,050 a month to have a new location. And uh, there we are on a pouring Easter Sunday in April. I think it was April 11th or so, 1982. And I was standing just like I am right now. And I'm looking at 200 people. And I said, you don't know this, but God told me you would be here today. Here you are. My God is true to his word. And I've known that through prayer since the beginning, when I first got saved to this day, when COVID hit, I knew that God, my God, shall supply all our need according to his riches in Jesus Christ. I knew that, and he has done that over and over again. Pray without ceasing. Our Christian faith turns our thoughts away from ourselves. Psalm 34, verse 4, I sought the Lord. He heard, and he delivered me from all my fears. And then finally, in everything, give thanks. Notice he says, in everything and not for everything. We come to learn that whatever comes our way is going to strengthen us. Under the most difficult pressures, we cast our cares on the Lord. And we do this because we know that God is in control. We know that God hears us. And we have a knowledge that God is for us. And that gives us the ability to be thankful. God's will is is, is that in everything we give thanks. It's not a, a, an obligation, this thankfulness. It's a continuing possibility in every joy, even in every sorrow. The things that keep us going is trust. It's this knowledge that strengthens us. We learn to give thanks. We know that our God is in control. We can become confused and we can struggle, but we trust him. In everything, When Job went through his terrible trial and his wife couldn't take it anymore, the pain her husband was going through was just too much. And she speaks up in Job 2 verse 9. His wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God. Die. Thank you, baby. I appreciate your <laughs> advice. She wasn't angry because he remained with integrity or how fast to his faith. It would seem she was upset because his faith didn't get him relief from pain. Seek God to take you out of your misery. You have no hope. But Job said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. 
He didn't understand what was going on, but later he did. In James 5.11, we count them blessed to endure. You've heard of the perseverance of Job. You've seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So these Christians are enduring perse persecution, and, and Paul says in closing, I counsel you to have joy, and I counsel you to pray. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be anxious for nothing in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Hold fast. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And God will be with you. And God will show himself strong on your behalf. Ask, and it shall be given. God will be there. He never leaves you, nor will he forsake you. He is close to those with a broken heart, and he will minister his comfort. Hold fast.